Welcome to FUQA's LinkedIn Live series, which brings you faculty talking about assorted topics every Wednesday at 1230 Eastern. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeremy Petrenka. I am an associate professor of the practice in FUQA's Econ Group. I'm also the programmatic dean of the Master of Quantitative Management program, and I am really thankful to have been given this opportunity to talk about uh, racial disparities in the workplace. And before I do, there's kind of three things that, that I just want to address up front. And the first is that it is frightening to talk about race issues. Um, you know, if we're being honest, I'm frightened talking about race issues. But we deeply need to in order to be able to move the needle. Um, a quote that I think really captures this idea and a lot of what I'm at least trying to scratch the surface on today is by James Baldwin, who says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And what I'm hoping that we can do today is to develop a language and an approach that might make it a little bit easier to have these conversations um, and, and to start thinking about how this change can happen and also seeing things that might have been completely out of our vision before now. Second, as you're gonna notice, most of my examples are focused on racial disparities in the black community inside America. That said, there is nothing specific to the approach that I'm, I'm going to get to that is specific um, to the black experience in America. Um, in particular, any marginalized group, looking at it in this way and thinking about this way, whether it's other racial groups, whether it is sexual orientation, whether it's neurodiversity, this is kind of the way to think about what's happening and get a better feel for it. And then lastly, I need to start by defining what I mean by racial disparity. Uh, when we're talking about race, words deeply matter. And so before I start talking about really where I wanna look, I wanna be really clear what, what the definition is that, that I'm working with. And at this point, and this is gonna change, but at this point, I'm abstracting away from the causal elements. And I'm looking at just the straight down the middle, what does it mean for a racial disparity to exist? And a racial disparity is an incongruity between the percentage of a racial group represented in the general population and the percentage of the same group represented in the sample of the population. And that sounds a little bit dry, but basically it boils down to, if all things were equal across races, there should be no, sample bias in any sample you pick. And let me let me show this with an example. Um, so if we looked at the share of the population, and my apologies that the numbers are a bit small, you're gonna see in a sec why, unfortunately, that has to be. But the share in the US, about 60% white, 13% black, 12% uh, Hispanic, and 15% other races. If, for instance, we had racial disparity in executive roles, then give or take you know, a little bit of variation, then we would see this breakdown in executive roles. If we were just randomly sampling, this is what we would expect to see. This is the, the situation where racial disparity does not seem to be an issue. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in, is if you actually look at the general population and compare it to the actual number of each race inside of a executive roles, you see this massive overrepresentation for white executives, and you see that the black population, which should be 13%, reduces down to three. The Hispanic reduces down to four. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about racial disparity. Now, I think that it is amazingly helpful at this point to break down the two reasons why this could happen. And to do this, I'm, I'm using the work of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Um, if you haven't read uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist or Stand from the Beginning, personally, I think they're absolutely amazing. But he makes the logically, in some ways obvious, but amazingly deep observation is, look, if you're pulling a sample and the sample ends up having some bias to it, one of two things has to happen as long as we're ignoring small sample bias, which we are. Um, but one of two things has to happen. Either the groups themselves are unequal. One group is actually better than the other group. But the other possibility is that the selection process itself does have some kind of bias built into it. And that bias might be entirely unintentional, but for whatever reason, the way that sample is being drawn 
is picking one group more than the other. And I think this distinction allows us to start talking about these issues in a way that can pull apart a little bit of the individual level piece, which is, you know, emotions can so easily get pulled in, which we do have to address, but it can separate those from the strictly policy ones and the strict ones that look, there was no intent for this and it's still happening. So in the world where we're talking about groups are different, that is the world of racist ideas. It's any idea that suggests one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. Racist ideas argue that the inferiorities and superiorities of racial groups explain away racial inequities in society. And so this can look like overt racism. This can look like covert racism, where it's hidden racism. This can look like implicit bias, where you don't actually know it's manifesting. But if you ever get to the point that, oh, well, that race is just different than that race, whether it's different and better or worse, whether it's genetic, whether it's cultural, whatever that is, that's the world of racist ideas. But the other world also has a huge effect. And this is what we call racist policies or policies that actually lead to racial disparities. Any measure that produces or sustains racial inequality between racial groups. And by policy, it can be written laws, it can be unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. This is re really where I wanna look today. Because one of the things that we hear oftentimes is when you hear people talk about, oh, it's a colorblind world. Um, you know, I don't see color. What they're generally talking about is, well, I don't have racist ideas. And unfortunately, that fundamentally misses the fact that so much disparity comes from policies we have in place in the historical arc that we've had. And I want to give you a very specific example from US history to paint this picture. And a lot of you likely already know about redlining. Uh, for those that do, I'm going to make this as concise as possible. For those that don't, it's going to paint the picture that I think is, is really shows what we're talking about. So redlining was a racist idea. And here's the way it works. So we are back in the Great Depression. It's the 1930s. Uh, a lot of houses are being foreclosed on. And the government created the Homeowners Loan Corporation. It was a government-sponsored corporation created as part of the New Deal that was designed to refinance uh, individuals and households that were about to lose their house. Okay, so you know, good, good intent. However, a very racist idea got built into it. And what ended up happening is because the government was backing these loans, they wanted some measure of risk. So they went out, they got census data, they asked a bunch of questionnaires, and they ended up creating this algorithm to predict the likelihood of property appreciation and then the perceived default risk. And they basically had four levels of risk, A, B, C, and D, but for you know, getting to why it's called redlining, green, blue, yellow, and red, where red, you could think of red as the subprime area. Now, these calculations were not actually based on actual probabilities. And that's a key piece here. This is where I say it was built on a racist idea. Turns out that race was a greater factor in a neighborhood's predicted decline than any other structural characteristics, such as the age of homes, proximity to city centers, credit worthiness of residents, transportation opportunities, public parks, or any other feature. If you basically superimpose the racial mix of a city and put it on top of the redlining maps, you will find a startlingly tight correlation. Okay, so 1933, this got built into the system. Well, here's the problem besides this program itself. These same rules then got built into the FHA with uh, Fannie Mae. And in particular, what this was is for decades and still in existence, it's government-backed mortgages that basically if people qualify for Fannie Mae, then someone, a private lender, can lend them the money but know that the government's going to back it. Okay, so that happened a little bit later in the 30s. And unfortunately, they used these same distinctions when assigning their credit risk. And this got put into their underwriting manual for decades. In the 1935 underwriting manual, quote, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. Again, even though empirically that wasn't true. 10, 12 years later, they softened the language a little bit, but it was still there specified lower valuations when compatibility among the neighborhood occupants was lacking, which you know, is just a slightly softer version of uh, racial segregation. 
And then 52 in the underwriting manual, continued to base property values in part on whether properties were located in neighborhoods where there was compatibility among the neighborhood occupants. So what ended up happening is you had now 30 plus years, so a generation, generation and a half, where black citizens were less likely to get a mortgage, less likely to get a low interest mortgage, and where segregation was effectively enforced, both at this level, but also at things like uh, HOA covenants. It is the case that the dominant form of wealth accumulation in America is owning a house. It's what lets you actually build equity. It's what lets you, when hard times hit, you can actually take a loan against your equity and you don't have to go bankrupt. You don't have to get a high interest loan. It is the key to so much of what we think about as progression throughout the years and from generational wealth being able to be passed on. And for 30 to 40 years, there was systemic underrepresentation here based on a racist idea. So now we go to 1968, okay? And now in theory with the Fair Housing Act, the racist idea is now out of the law. The Fair Housing Act basically said, oh, you can't do this. Okay, fine, here's the problem. Anything you base on wealth, for instance, the ability to pay back a loan, the equity you need to get a small business loan, anything is now going to be skewed, even if that policy was not designed to have a racist idea, even if it's straight actuarial. Because in 1968, after this had been happening for almost 40 years, if you look at the home ownership rates of white versus black households, white households were 64%. Black households were only 41%. If you look at household wealth, and this one is the most striking, white households had about $50,000 in household wealth, black had less than 3,000. There was a 20 times disparity, which again makes perfect sense the way we know that wealth accumulates inside of owning a home in, in America. And then lastly, because these, these uh, the redlining and the, the the underwriting rules basically promoted segregation, you ended up in a strongly segregated America. That if you actually take a measure of household racial isolation, in other words, do how many, what percent of white households live in basically an all white area, what percent of black basically live in an all black area, both of them are incredibly high. That coming into 1968, 92% of white households were in a white neighborhood, 66% of black. Um, so the segregation happened as well. And now suddenly you have a world where anything based on wealth, anything based on ability to pay back, anything based on location, it will have a different outcome for different races, even if racist ideas have nothing to do with it. Because this is the starting point. History determines how policies will enact going forward. And I wanna show you specific examples of this, all the different ways this manifested itself. So what the most obvious thing that's going to come out is a denial of a mortgage. If you don't have equity to put into it, you're not going to be able to get the mortgage. Notice this is from 1998 to 2016. This is recent data. There is still almost a 2x disparity in the mortgage denial rate in the Black community versus the white community, which again, you can link back all the way to these extremely low wealth levels. On top of that, if you look at the rates that are actually paid today, so this is 2017, you see that black households pay higher rates, which from an actuarial, actuarial uh, perspective, you would say, well, if there's lower wealth and there's less equity you have, you pay higher rates. But again, that's a disparity that comes through from the historic pieces. In particular, if you look at these lowest three interest rates, what you'll see is that white households get those at a higher percentage rate than black households. If you look at this next tier, um, which are not good, this is where it now flips. And now black hole households have more of these high interest rates than white households. And if you look at truly subprime, greater than 8% mortgages, black households have more than double the amount of white households. And again, all of this in theory is this, you know, this colorblind idea where we're just looking at ability to pay back, but racial disparities will come through in the policies themselves. If you look at default rates, so this was the period between 20, 2007 and 2009, so during the financial, uh, the financial crisis, the white mortgage default rate was 4.5%, the black was 
Again, if you have less equity in the house, if you have less wealth, then when an economic shock happens, you are more likely to be foreclosed on because you're not going to be able to get through that gap. Okay, so I'll put all of this together, and it should not be surprising that given where we started in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was put into law, and in theory, the racist ideas were pulled out of the law. And by the way, I'm not claiming that racist ideas do not still exist. But even if we took our theoretical best case scenario and said, no, 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 that solved that problem, it doesn't solve the disparities because of the wealth. If you actually look at the wealth gap, and these show everything from 89 to 2019, it is in percent terms almost as bad as it was in 1968, and in absolute terms, it is worse. This is the type of thing we're talking about. That yes, there can be racist ideas, which is just your straight over racism, but there can also be these policies that we just don't even recognize that they might be having a different effect. And I want to give you some examples, specifically on the policy side of where this might manifest inside of your organization, and then an approach to, to maybe start trying to find them. So I want to look at hiring practices first. What we have said is anything based on wealth will have a disparity. A whole lot is based on wealth. One of them is the ability to get a degree. If you are currently requiring a degree for a job position, now, in some cases, completely necessary, no question. If you are building a bridge and you need a geotechnical engineer, you pretty much need that specialized skill. But so often, people just need some entry-level job, and without even thinking, it's just, well, why not put a college degree? It's almost like you're getting that for free, but you're not. The fact is, if all you're doing is requiring a college degree for a role or not, you are now going to be filtering your diversity as it'll take the black population from 13 down to eight and the Hispanic from 12 to six. So already the pool you have coming in by this one decision starts shrinking. Okay, up next, what majors are you pulling out of? Have you ever asked yourselves, why are we getting the majors that we're getting? That we're taking this group and then kind of adding this skill set. Could we take this other group and add a different skill set? I want to give you an example, and um, unfortunately, this is an example of economics undergrad degrees. Um, this is not something I'm proud of as an economist, but the Fed a few years back did a really, uh, really detailed study on the kind of racial disparities we see in the economics field. If all you're doing is deciding to just select out of economics departments, you are moving your black candidates from 13% of the population to three with that one decision alone. If you're Hispanic, you're moving from 12 to 7. And again, I don't think anyone that says, hey, we're going to go hire from an econ department is, you know, I really don't think that that's happening for racist idea reasons. I mean, it could be, but hopefully it's not. I think it's just the, the not seeing what is actually happening and what is that's going to cause in terms of the filtering. If we look at the schools, the fact is different schools have different rates of uh, racial inclusion. If we look at the Ivy Leagues, if that's primary, and not to pick on the Ivy Leagues, this is a problem in a lot of places. But if you just look at the Ivy Leagues, um, all the way to the right is where we would be if we had racial disparity. No one's really close. And by the way, this isn't the, the number of applicants, this is uh, the number of accepted. This is actually on campus. On top of that, have you ever given thought to what interview methods you're using? And I don't mean formalizing the question, so it's not just an informal talk. We already know that that can help mitigate some of the racist ideas piece where we just like people that are like us. I'm talking about the literal, do we have a virtual interview? Do we have a case interview? Do we have a group interview? Do we have a face-to-face -face interview? I actually can't give you research on this because I couldn't find it. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I couldn't find whether there is a disparity in the type of interview we're doing. But my guess, my strong guess is the answer is yes. I can imagine a group interview would absolutely be more difficult for an underrepresented group than it would for the majority group. Um, but this is the type of question. Have you ever really asked the question, is that alone? If you're doing case interviews, if a certain part of the population has access to case training, and another one doesn't, you're going to be filtering. Okay, other things that, that could have completely not been on your radar, literally the choice of location. So remember that one of the things we said is that coming out of redlining, you ended up with this, this, deep, uh, this deep separation um, between the races. 
Well, that doesn't just immediately go away. Uh, normally, people live where they grew up. And just the fact that it's difficult to break in where you know, you're, the, you're the only outsider, we would expect this to stay the same. And unfortunately, it has. This is Chicago uh, today. If we go ahead and put colors in, so if we put colors in for different racial groups, what we see is we have a highly segregated uh, area. Um, if we put a, our, uh, our building in countryside, which is on the west side right in the middle, versus the south side, who we're going to get applying to our jobs and who is able to actually get to our job site is going to be fundamentally different just because of that choice. If we look at New York, exact same issue. Pretty much any major city because of how the suburbs are formed with the FHA period, with, the, with uh, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, you will see this effect. On top of that, are you making people come to the office? And again, it sounds like, well, why would that have any kind of racial disparity? Well, one reason is that if, depending on where you're located, you might be causing one racial group to have to travel farther, which itself is a bigger burden. But on the other, remember, a lot of this is about wealth and more black households do not own a vehicle compared to white households. If all you're doing is requiring that, well, then you can start, you are now cutting the, the, the amount of applicants, you're cutting the ability for more black households than you are white households which then begs the question, you know, could you be located near public transportation? Could you provide transportation from a public transportation hub? But know that that choice will cause something to happen. And you might say, well, we could, we could go virtual as long as they have access to internet at home. Note there's a disparity there too, because again, it's based on wealth. So that's the world we're in. And so the question now is how can we even begin to attack this? And I would like to propose an approach that's, that's based a lot on the thinking of Kaplan and Norton's strategy map. So for those that haven't seen it, this is a uh, strategy execution approach that basically says, look, if you are trying to achieve some top level goal, what you can't do is wait five years and then go, did we do it? You have to enable your entire company to be successful. You have to start at the bottom, which leads into the next levels. Specifically, they said, look, to achieve anything, you have to start with the people and processes. They have to be aligned with what you want to do. So this learning and growth perspective is we're going to enable our resources so that they can deliver the strategic processes, so that you can align with customer opportunities and mitigate threats. And if you do that right, then you're going to get the financial outcome. But these things build on each other. What's so important is that there are definitely outcome measures, which are your traditional goals, but this also introduces performance measures throughout the process. So you don't have to wait four years to see if it works. You can say, wait, have we hit those intermediate measures? Is that where we need to go or can we adjust? And I want to take this and just modify it a little bit into what I call a progress map. So here it's your DE&I goal, but how do we build that up? And the key is it's not one silver bullet that's going to change things in your company. It's going to be increasing the percentage here by 2%, here by 2%, here by 2%. So we have to start with recruitment. We're going to minimize racial disparities in our hiring processes while creating an environment that doesn't alienate any group of our employees. We have to get people in the building. Then we have to make sure the culture is aligned. So now once the culture is aligned and they want to stay, that's going to then make we have to make sure that it ensures a promotion path that doesn't favor one group over another. And if we do that, then we're gonna achieve our goals. In the exact same way, we have outcome and performance measures here. Okay, the one thing I'm gonna to add to this is I wanna actually split this in half. And I wanna talk about the specific initiatives that would lead to uh, minimization of racist ideas. Then on the other side, the policy piece. And you can, in some degree, look at these separately. Some of them obviously overlap, but a lot of them, don't. And so how do we pick these performance measures? I think it takes a, a really a deep look at each step of your firm's career life cycle. And first ask how much racial disparity actually exists. If anything I said today was a surprise, if you said, I didn't realize there was a disparity in the number of cars, then there's more places to look. Um, you have to see how much filtering has happened. You just have to know. Number two, once you see it, you have to ask why. 
if you ever get to the point that you say, oh, well, that group just likes these jobs better, you've accidentally slipped into the raises ideas world. Keep asking why though, what is happening? What's, what's preventing it? Are we doing something? Is there a filtering that's going on? Never assume, and this is where you oftentimes can't get there on your own. You need to bring, this is where inclusivity in the room is so important. Why aren't we seeing applications for this? What's preventing you from doing this? What are the obstacles in your way? Once we have that, then ask, okay, we have an idea of why, are those policies necessary? Really ask, you know, do you need a college degree? You know, give me a military vet that's been in the military for 10 years to do my operations and I'm happy as can be. I don't necessarily care if they have a college degree. Ask yourself, are the things you're doing, are you just doing them because that's how it's always been done? How do you know you can't change? If the answer is we just know, question your assumptions. And then lastly, given your organization's unique needs, figure out the level of improvement that can actually be achieved. And this is one where one size does not fit all. If you are a pharmaceutical company and you just have to have PhDs in organic chemistry, then you will have a subset that's already been filtered down and your scope of influence is just smaller and you're gonna to have to make sure you just don't filter it even more. But you need to look at, well, where could change happen? What policies do we have into place? So once we have that, that idea, then we can start looking at every level. I'm not going to, for time, I'm obviously not going to talk about all of these. But if you think about on the recruitment side, on the ideas, that's where you're going to be talking about anti-bias training, where we're going to talk about things we know help in the interview process, like standardized questions and diverse interviewers. But on the policy side, you're going to look at all those policies we had talked about, also things like background checks, which again will be uh, correlated with wealth. Then you say, well, once we have the people in, and again, this doesn't have to be one, then two, then three, you can be looking at these at the same time. You then say, okay, culturally, what are we doing on the idea side that we can start mitigating? And that tends to be more at the individual levels. But then what are the, what are the policies we have in place? Something as simple as how you treat people that show up late. Well, if the world is segregated, which it is, and some groups have to drive farther than others, then you're going to introduce additional late uh, factor of being late. And how do you want to handle that? Will that be separating ultimately what you want to see? Once you have people staying at your company, then the question is in terms of advancement, what are some of the, the bias side things we've seen? But again, what are the specific policies? And are there, are there policies that might be causing this gap that you don't want to see? And together, those are going to feed into your DNI. And again, one of the reasons I don't go too much into this at this point is it will be a little bit custom. You have to know what your recruitment path looks like, what your culture path looks like, but you need to look at every stage and remember you can be measuring these things as it's happening because 1% here and 1% here and 1% here and 1% here, you have suddenly transformed your company. And that's what we're looking to do. So with that, I wanna open it up to questions. Um, there, there's one in the chat, but, but before I get to that, I wanna, I wanna answer one that as I was developing this and talking with some people, um, I, I asked someone from industry if he had any questions. And he asked a question I think is, is worth addressing. And he said, is this, is this basically advocating for something that looks like a quota system? And my answer is no and yes in that order. And in particular, when we oftentimes hear about quotas and whether we're talking about DE&I quotas, whether we're talking about you know, sales targets, with growth targets, where you get this really severe pushback is when they are arbitrary and you are not empowered or incentivized to make it happen. For instance, new CEO comes, let's say she says, all right, everyone, 20% um, increase in growth in five years. And that's the end of the story. No one knows how they're supposed to get there. They don't know how they're supposed to do their existing job to get there. They don't know or the process is going to be in place. And it becomes this fight against what seems like an arbitrary number. And in that sense, that is a world where the outcome measure is the only thing you're looking at. And you're not building that based on what is possible at every level. What I am saying is no, every company will be unique. Where you're located in America, you have different racial demographics. What are your requirements are, your true requirements? Once you strip out and really ask, is that necessary? It will be different, but you start asking, how can we do this? What is our scope of influence? What can we move? But you build it with that and then you empower everything. You, you put resources into it. You ask, you know, could we provide transportation from a 
public transportation depot to our office. You know, if we just had a bus running for an hour in the morning, an hour at night, could we solve the location disparity that we see? So to the degree that there are metrics, yes, nothing will be achieved if you don't measure it. Um, to the degree that, uh, you know, it's something you aim for, yeah, absolutely. And you need to incentivize towards it too, but this is built up much more, uh, much more naturally. Okay, so one thing um, uh, Steve wrote in a question. So one of the things you'll notice on this is that it, it is known that uh, different forms of training can be received differently. Um, and I think one of the things that's helpful with this approach is that there is a distinction between ideas and policies. And oftentimes when you just show the data on the policies, this is how we're filtering. Much like any kind of change management piece, it reduces some of the emotional piece. Now, the idea side is still gonna be a more emotional one because it's individual. It's saying, look, you need to question how you approach things. Um, you know, are you introducing some bias you might not realize? But policies, there's a policy and it's causing something. And that tends to be where there's a, there can be a more creative piece. Well, how could we solve that? What, what's a way that we can maybe reduce that? And you tend to have the change piece at least a little bit easier uh, on that side. Okay, I think I have time for one more. Um, and then again, another one that, that has come up from time to time. How do we sit, uh, handle the small sample size problem? <laughs> you know, this is, this is great when uh, we have a big company and we can invest in people analytics and we can look at all this. Remember that a good part of this basis is not just the numbers. Um, if you look at the second point here, uh, why is that racial disparity existing? Hearing the lived experience, you know, having the empathetic, um, the empathetic piece of what are your challenges? Why isn't that here? that can be more powerful and more informative than just a straight numbers-based piece to really understand why. So even if you don't have all the numbers, it in no way stops you from asking, you know, reasonable, well, would that make sense that maybe we're making that difficult? Let's get out into the community, let's ask. And if it is, then we have to ask ourselves, is there something we could do with our policy? Because again, a lot of these policies, it's just the way business is done, it doesn't have to be. Is there something we can do and still achieve our, our strategic goals? Okay, so with that, I believe I'm out of time. Again, I want to just deeply thank you um, for, for giving me this opportunity. Again, we need to talk about this. We need to start moving the needle. And I hope this gives at least a little bit of, of a way to think about it, to start realizing these disparities are coming throughout. Um, and the more we can start moving it, the more the transformation starts to happen. Okay, so with that, uh, I would invite all of you uh, next week, our LinkedIn Live series, we are going to, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Adriano Rampini, who will be talking about the risk management paradox, which is a really cool thing that firms should be hedging more financially, but they don't. And so he's going to be talking about how he knows, but also why. So I would ask that you join us then. And if you're interested, please follow Fuqua on LinkedIn Live and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.